just a little bit of background about myself. I joined TP in October. I've got to say, I feel like I've totally landed on my feet. Can't lie about that. It's been brilliant so far. Um, um, prior to that, I was um, working at SLD school. Majority of my background is SLD PMLD. And I've got a real big interest in sensory, sensory processing, um, which is why I've kind of pulled this together. Some of the other training is sort of more SLD aimed, but this one isn't isn't really linked to cognitive ability. So I'm hoping that lots of you will find it interesting. Um, I had a look at quite a few cards when I first arrived of young people for their needs and sensory processing was coming up time and time again. So yeah, that's why we pulled it together. Um, so yeah, should we just go for it? Yeah. Away we go, Nikki. People are nodding. I'm loving it already. Okay, yeah. right. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So these are the aims. We're going to have a little look at what's actually sensory processing is. And I know lots of you will have experience. So please um take on board what you think is useful. Um, I'm also going to have a look at the difference between over-responsive versus under-responsive. It just means that it makes it easier long term if we're all kind of using the same language. Um, we'll have a quick look at the impact of the eight sensory systems. Yes, that is eight. OK, we'll have a quick look at those. And then we're also going to explore some sensory profiles. Um, like I said, there's going to be time for discussion sort of after every part. Um, with my with my background, kind of when I was working with my teachers, we always used to say, OK, let's make sure we get the young person's sensory needs met. Is the learning environment correct for them in terms of is it aimed at the right level of their, their cognition, cognitive ability? And then have we ticked kind of expressive communication and receptive? And then I feel like our young people are then in a place and ready to learn. So um, I'm not going to talk about the other two things, but since we process what this is all going to be about. Um, OK, right. So what is sensory processing? Now, I'm very mindful we can all read, so I'm not one of these people that's going to read the entire all the information on every page, all right? <laughs> okay. Right, I just need to get it to the right. Right, this has got a little bit of an American twang throughout, but I feel like it's still useful to listen to it. I have autism and S. Not there, I need to move on a bit more, sorry. Here we go. Vision, touch, proprioceptive, and vestibular. Under-responsive versus over-responsive. You can think of each your sensory systems as being a cup. And water is that type of a sensory input. If you are under responsive to a certain sensory input, it is like you're a big huge cup. You keep getting water to the big cup. You can just keep adding and adding, but it never feels full. But if you are over responsive, it is like you are a tiny cup. All you need is just a little sensory input and you overflow. You want your cup to be full and not spill over. Each of your sensory systems is their own cup and they are different sizes. Just because you have one big cup does not mean you are under-responsive with all your senses. I have a big cup for my proprioceptive and vestibular senses and a little cup for my touch, sound, taste, and smell senses. Everyone is a different and unique. Okay, can you guys hear that okay? Yes, okay. All right. thanks. You're welcome. So that's kind of the introduction to the whole big cup, little cup um, explanation. I don't know why, but it always makes me want to go like this. I'm not sure if many of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but yeah, that a big cup, little cup. So we're just going to go into it. Sorry. Okay. Can everybody see that all right? Because I can't see. I not can on my see phone, no. Yeah? Everyone all right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So really, lots of you will know this already, but I've just put this up here for us to, rem to remind ourselves that actually we need to make sure our young people are in a position to process and to be able to, to engage in their, their learning. So 
I always view sensory processing as being both proactive and reactive. Um, yes, we want to get that young person kind of in the right mindset to learn, but equ equally, we don't want to be really, really strict and rigid with the structure of how we use sensory processing. So, yeah, we want to give them a good bit of input, make sure they're then in a, pro in a situation where they can process, then they can respond, and let's be honest, they're then ready for learning. Okay? Okay. So, I'm just going to see if I can... How do I get rid of you guys on the side, not being rude? <laughs> Don't worry, I've done it. Don't worry, I've done it. <laughs> okay. Right. okay. So these, this is the whole bit about over-responsive versus under-responsive. <clears throat> so in, in the little video, that young lad was talking about a small cup and a little cup. With the little cup, it really is a, is a situation of the fact that regardless of, um, if, you, if, you, if, if you give them too much sensory overload, they're literally just going to spill over. So these are kind of our guys that really have that sort of fight and flight reaction because they're just so overwhelmed by the overflowing of their cup in, in a certain sense. So these will be our young guys that you're kind of seeing the way they react. Um, they might be screaming or shout, shouting or crying, or it could be their flight response where they literally just run away, covering their ears or hiding. So that's our young people that are over responsive. Does that resonate with some of you? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, then we move on to our young people that are much more um, in this bracket of being under responses. So this, I almost feel like not only is it a big cup, it's got a few holes in it, this cup, because it just doesn't matter how much sensory information you're putting in there. It's just never, never enough. Um, so we think of them having a big cup and requiring a much larger amount of sensory information in order to fill up their cup. So under responsive young people, they'll often really just miss out on those cues that we would just assume that young people can pick up on. Um, often it'll be the verbal, but also those visual instructions, you know, that body language that you just naturally give away that you're not necessarily even making a conscious decision about. Lots of our young people really need to key into that. Um, and these guys find that really, really difficult. And they also struggle with things like coordinating their, their movements. Um, so if you're working with a young person that, had, that is really under responsive and they've got this big, huge cup, these are your guys that will be jumping and running, spinning. I used to teach a young lad and he used to take the register for me every day. And every day he would leave my classroom and do about six or seven spins with his arms out like that with the register. And then it'd be all right, because then he could then cross the playground and go into the main building. And without a doubt, he did that every single day. So, um, yeah, so th these young people are ones that are really kind of like on the go movement an awful lot. But they also may appear to just be completely under aroused. So that's kind of the over responsive and the under responsive. OK. Everyone there still because can't see you. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Okay, thank you. Okay, so I've just put a little bit in here about what the different sensory systems are. Now, lots of you will know these already. Um, a lot of the time, though, unless you're work used to working with fabulous young people like we have, um, lots of people won't have necessarily have heard of vestibular proprioception. And also, some, um, some staff will also talk about seven, whereas actually there is the eighth, which is more to do with like the internal body. So what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to go through each one of these and kind of then explain to you guys um, how that would present in a young person and how that would impact on their world, um, whether they be whether they be lacking in something or whether they actually need a little bit more to do with that sense. All right. Okay. A tactile. So our over responsive young person with tactile. Um, there are guys that really are not a big fan of like messy play they might not even like having a shower it could be like certain clothing just really aggravates them or a certain texture with food under responsive um, are our young people that much prefer to mouth things quite frequently and often because they just need to be double they just need to be double checking like what is this what does it feel like um it's often items that aren't food related as well. So, yeah, that's for our young people with when we're talking about tactile. OK. Um, oh, right. Proprioception and vestibular. Um, I'll be honest, the majority of young people that I've ever taught in SLD normally fill into this kind of bracket. 
um, proprioception are under responsive guys really struggle with the whole awareness of their body, like where they are within space. Where does their body end? How do it, how does it feel against something like, you know, all of that they really, really do struggle with. So these guys are our, are our young people that will be jumping, possibly throwing themselves to the floor or to the ground um, to, sorry, or to a wall just to get that feedback. Often, often they'll just use far too much force, even in kind of like an everyday moment, um, everyday um, action really more than anything. Sorry, I'm getting all nervous now. Are we all right? <laughs> <laughs> um, over responsive young people um, for vestibular they're really really worried about going often going from one threshold to another um, so if you're going to move from like a carpeted area to a laminate floor for example it could be completely aligned but for them it will feel very very different they'll be very aware of it um, they will be very very slow in kind of their movements um, that's for someone who's over, over responsive to a vestibular. Our young guys that are under responsive, they'll be our kind of like real thrill seekers. So they are our young people who, yeah, they're pretty much like I put their daredevil movements, um, constantly on the go. You know, some young people will have those wobble cushion things, but for others, that's really not enough. I used to teach lots of kids that would just be literally bouncing on their balls whilst we were teaching them. I had one young man and he really, every so often would just jump up, run and just want to be upside down on his head because that would give him enough feedback and then he'd come back to carry on working again. So yeah, often we will have more young people within these brackets where actually their sensory processing is around proprioception or vestibular. Right. So we'll go on to visual and hearing. Um, they're quite straightforward, really. I know lots of you would know a lot of this stuff. If a young person's over responsive with their sight, it can be really easily distracted. It's quite hard for them to focus on what you think is the important um, piece of information um, because they'll often get wrapped up in the, in the fine details that is not at all what you're wanting them to focus on. Um, they'll often lose their place when reading. Under responsive young people, they just might not notice things when the environment changes um, because they're just not clued into being open and seeing that kind of stuff. So somebody new walking into the room just may, they may not even clock it. Um, they will often seek out really bright, reflective or spinning objects just to give them that feedback. Okay, then with hearing, over responsive young people, often find the noise completely overwhelming lots of you'll be what would have already be working with young people that will cover their ears um i can remember we had to work incredibly hard with our young people when we moved from an old school to a new building and all of a sudden every single toilet had hand dryers now that was a nightmare to go down any corridor for some of our young guys so we had to do an awful lot, lot of work around hand dryers because trying to ignore a hand dryer for the rest of your life is never going to open up your world, you know. So there was lots of work on that. Um, and the responsive young people, um, they, they will not only seek out loud vocalisations, but they'll be doing that with themselves an awful lot as well. Um, often you'll hear people talk about, you know, your quiet voice or your indoor voice. But for these guys, they really just can't help it. They need that. They need that extra, extra volume. Okay. Right, okay, so taste. I'm still not quite sure what I'm thinking of little icon with a tongue hanging out, but I feel like we're just going to go for it now. <laughs> so the over-responsive young people um, will often have a very limited diet, um, almost, almost like a bit of a beige diet, to be fair, um, and will have find things like textures and taste quite difficult. The complete opposite of that is young people that really just want a lot of spice in their life they will often mouth an awful lot of different objects um some edible some some not um lots of you will probably have already heard of peak up so i've just popped that in there that's not to say that every young person who is under responsive for taste will obviously have a diagnosis of peak that's not what i'm saying it's just sometimes they go hand in hand um yeah the smell one i think this is quite interesting because I never, for, well, for quite some time, I didn't often used to realise that smell had such an impact on young people. Um, 
and it was only because I was very lucky to work with a young per with a teacher who was incredibly gifted at working with young people who were who were PMLD that she introduced me to like the whole kind of like smell of the day and smell that relates to a certain subject and it just opened my eyes and it was only then that I realized how smells really do impact on young people an awful lot of the time um, and it's things that we can just filter out quite easily I mean we all know something that's like baked bread I'm a fan of that Greg's like to walk past there and smell Greg's you know mm. but um but yeah so smell I've added in there I don't think it comes up too often but I think it's one to be mindful of okay and then the last one is to do with the internal part of, of someone's body, the internal organs really of your body. Because for young, some, some young people, they're just completely unaware of what their body is trying to tell them. So they won't know when they're thirsty. They won't know when they need to go to the toilet. Often these young people find it really hard to regulate their body temperature. Um, you'll see them, you'll see some young people in the summer still with their coat like done up because someone's told me I must wear my coat to school and there it is with like, you know, um, and they won't realise they're getting overheated. Often these young people, it can be linked to toilet training, not all the time, but it, I think also one to be mindful of is often these young people really find it difficult to fall to sleep of a night because they just don't allow themselves to relax they don't they're almost not in the right mindset to go okay now I'm ready to sleep so right I'm gonna try and get you all back without hanging up on you oh I can see people fabulous, <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> right that's the first part. So that's basically looking at what all the different senses are and also just going over that whole um, over-responsive, under-responsive, big cup, little cup. Are we all there so far? Yes. Yeah. Oh, there's nods. Thank you for the people that aren't just nodding and said yes. I appreciate that massively. Yes, Nikki. <laughs> Hooray. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions at this point or are you okay if I just keep going? I just ask one really quick thing. Go on, of course. Can, can they be both? Because I recognise, uh, I've got I've got a student that I recognise both things. He's both under responsive and over responsive with the yeah. same with the same thing. Yeah. Absolutely, because if you think about it, the whole time who is that that's talking? Sorry, because I can't see it's you. Jude. Oh, hello, Jude. Yeah, absolutely, oh, yeah. without a doubt. Because a lot of the time, our young people, if you think about it, the environment's constantly changing. The the kind of um, challenges that are being put upon you are constantly changing. How you feel about life is constantly changing. Without a doubt, you will be very much like this. Yeah, yeah. which is why I always try to kind of, it's a good question, thank you. Which is why I always try to think of sensory process instead of kind of going, OK, yes, we want to be proactive and yes, we want to meet a young person's need. But we've really got to listen to them. We've got to look out for it as well, because a young person will change depending on their on their environment or possibly, like we said before, in terms of did they sleep well? I don't know. Has someone in the house decided to cook something? different for dinner and that's really still bothering me even though that was like yesterday there's a whole different range of reasons so yeah it's not a thing of tick the box one one it then fits that young person yeah thank you and when we get onto sensory profiles that actually links really well to it Joe. so thank you because although I'm about to kind of go through what the different sensory profiles are when I used to do my training with this at my last school my staff used to go oh brilliant so now I totally know my young people in my class and I don't know what profiles they are. And I say, no, th that's not it. You can't just go, there you go. That, that's them for the year now. <laughs> they will change. And um, yeah, so thank you very Brilliant. much for that. Thank question. you. You're welcome. Right, I'm going to lose you all again, hopefully not forever. And then Nikki. we'll keep going. <laughs> Nikki. Oh, hello. Can I just ask, what is Pika? Sorry. No, 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 don't be silly, don't be silly, don't say, so apologise. So that will be for a young person that will want to eat and bite, sometimes swallow, not always swallow, swallow inedible, inedible objects. Okay. So I used to have a young man that would at home, I'm about to point to my wall, you can't see behind me, I do, <laughs> but would actually nibble on the corner of walls because his mum had not long, she'd got rid of, she'd not long put in, in wallpaper and that nibbling on wallpaper did something for him. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, 
thank you. It's a lovely question. I apologise, Fiona, for not explaining that. Um, yeah, so not not saying that ev every young person that has difficulties with sensory processing around taste will have PICA, um, but often they will go hand in hand. Okay, thank All you. Right? You're welcome. Thank you. Right. Okay. So we're just going to look at the sensory profiles now. Okay. So just to give you a little bit of background where this came about was that during the when the pandemic hit in that first lockdown I was uh, teaching at an SLD school we were really really lucky in the fact that we used to buy in an independent occupational therapist because getting OT input is pretty much non-existent isn't it as most of us know so yeah we used to get have this um independent OT. When the pandemic hit, lots of our parents really struggled because all of a sudden they couldn't access out um, the community. They weren't able to meet their young person's sensory needs. Some of them didn't have gardens. So we did a, did a piece of work where we tried to pull together some um, kind of practical guidance for our families. Um, so that's where they started. And then over time, we've kind of, we built on it and built on it. And then I used to, we used to use it for training for all of our new staff. So these are the... Hi, my name is Tanya Seven. I'm an oh. occupational therapist from Jumpstart Centre. I didn't know that he'd actually gone. Sorry. Did I press play? I must have done, mustn't I? Sorry. No, I did by mistake. I was trying to download the um, the handouts and that oh, one started automatically when I got to those beautiful pictures. Sorry. Oh, no, you're all right. I, thought, I was like, how did I do that? I didn't even move. No, I know. I was, <laughs> I was pretty shocked when I looked and saw those pictures as well. So, yeah. Did you go into panic mode? You're fine. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi. No, no, don't worry. You're fine. You're absolutely fine. <laughs> Where, where the voice that was coming through was actually the OT that, that I used to work with. Yeah, so this is where this has come from. I just want to make sure that I'm really, really clear about the fact that none of us are occupational therapists, so we cannot write a sensory diet for our young people. But as teachers, what we can do is suggest activities to parents and carers, um, just to just as a this may work for with your young person. And obviously we can we can use them when we're teaching as well. So okay. Right. I'm going to try now to move on to the bit I want to show you. Can I, I just want to see at the bottom here, I did put what number I was on. Can anyone see that at the bottom? Rachel, can you see it? 16, I think. No, the time is I put in it. doesn't matter. I'll no. find it. That's all right. Don't worry. I know it's four minutes, I think. We'll move along. Right, okay. Because we haven't got eight minutes to watch it, have we? But, yeah. you'll, but you'll be able to see here. Um, but it's on the tutor portal yeah okay Ooh. right <laughs> right okay so what we actually went for we went for four different um characters um the my the ot picked um winnie the pooh tigger eeyore and um rabbit and each one will describe a young person in terms of their sensory needs. So we'll have a little look at this. And then what I'm going to do afterwards is then go into each sensory profile. We'll delve a bit deeper into what they what that young person kind of needs. And then the last part is when we'll then look at the kind of like practical things that you guys can be doing with your young people. All right, so I'm just gonna play this for now. Here is Winnie the Pooh, who is our bystander. Winnie usually presents with low arousal, seems to need a lot of input to get going, misses environmental cues, can be seen with clothes twisted or back to front on the body, won't notice if they have food on their face or maybe dirty hands, often are poorly organised, can be clumsy or demonstrate poor motor skills. These learners often look disengaged or disinterested. They may even be in their own world. Here we have Tigger, our sensory seeker. These learners are the ones that touch everything. They put food in their mouths or they put toys in their mouths. They might smell people, clothing, toys. 
They bounce around and move around, constantly moving and struggle to sit still. They might be seen to stamp or hit their arms off desks or bump their bodies off the walls. They may love extreme sports if they're coordinated or they might enjoy just moving, including running and spinning. They may be seen to be impulsive, like loud music or talk in a really loud voice and like strong tastes or spices on their food. They seek out strong and intense sensations to fill their big cup. Our rabbit is very sensitive, however passive. So we may, may see that they are very aware of their surroundings, have difficulty maintaining attention, may be picky and complain frequently, can be very particular or strict about certain of daily routines, can dislike the seams in their clothes or noise being too loud, can find certain lighting too bright and have really controlling behaviours over others and also their own routines. Our final character is Eeyore. He's our active avoider. Often seen to put hands over their ears, cover their head or eyes or nose, to block out the light or a smell or any other stimulus around them. Sometimes they hide under the table or they might be the ones that run out of the room. They may avoid sticky or messy textures on their hands. That's also known as being tactile defensive. And they may avoid large playground equipment that includes intense movement, like swings or slides. So now we know about sensory profiles and self-regulation strategies. How can we help? Our learners. Okay. Can everybody hear that all right? Yeah. yeah. Yes, thanks. Oh. Hi, my name is Tanya Slevin. We don't need to listen to Tanya again. She's fabulous, but we won't listen to her for a second time. Okay. <laughs> so, um, okay. So do, do you like the Winnie the Pooh character? So that kind of like make a bit sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah they do. Okay. It's so good. <laughs> it is really good, I think. Yeah, I'm not, it's not, really great. I don't mean because I put this little bit together. What I mean is I thought it was such a good idea for, with the OT. And i got to say, it really helped when we were discussing young people because, like I said before, everybody's then using the same language. And whenever I um, think about each one of these characters, I can instantly think of a young person. And I'm sure as when you guys were listening, you were doing the same thing. You were like, oh my gosh, yeah, so-and-so is a total tigger. Like, yeah, things like that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but, but remember, like when Jude asked that question, remember, um, someone may not present as a tigger the, the entire time. So we need to make sure that we, not, we don't sort of pigeonhole them. The majority of the time, a young person will present quite, um, quite the same, but sometimes they, they, will, um, they, they will present slightly differently. Okay, so. What we're going to do, <clears throat> excuse me, we're just going to go through each character in a little bit more um, information, give a bit more information. And then at the end, I'll then look at what some of these activities would be. So the activities that we pull together are alerting, organising and calming. And depending on your character will depend on how many of each one of them you will need. Like, for example, a Tigger does not need alerting anymore. I feel like they're fully alert already. OK, <laughs> so. The Eeyore is the avoider. I don't like to use avoider, I just prefer Eeyore, if that's okay. <laughs> um, so this young person very much needs to have much more organisation and, and calm put into them to help with their regulation. So it said on here, top tip, you, use lots of heavy work activities or activities that use our proprioceptive proprioceptive sense excuse me put my teeth in again okay so for heavy work we'll give some examples but I just want to say this now lots of you probably would have heard of things like weighted blankets weighted belts vests there's a whole list of equipment out there I just want to be really clear that 
um, only an OT can prescribe that kind of stuff and be and be um, and make sure the issue is in the right um, the right amount. So I won't be talking about that side of things. I know it's out there, but obviously we're not OTs. So um, yeah, I just want you to put that in there. But some of you may hear of that kind of equipment, or you might read in an EHCP that that would be useful. But just so you know, we, we can't all now go out and buy buy big weighted blankets or get your sewing machine out. We're not allowed to, okay? <laughs> right. So yeah, so ER, ER needs between one or two alerting activities, two to three organising and two to three calming. Um, that doesn't mean that all of this happens at the same time. You don't go, okay, right, come in, young person. I've got eight activities for you. Let's go. It's really not that. It's, it's <laughs> about you using your professional judgment, being clear about how that young person is presenting, really listen to what they're saying, also what not what and also what they're not saying, obviously. And um, yeah, but it's almost almost view it as all of you of tutors will have a bag of tricks that you carry around with yourself constantly, yeah? This is just having more tricks added to that bag. That's kind of how I view it, all right? So Winnie the Pooh or bystander. Look, with his hands on his hips, he looks quite happy still, doesn't he? So I'm just going to go for Winnie the Pooh as opposed to bystander, I think. <laughs> so this guy is uh, Winnie the Pooh. He's our guy that's really slow in his responses. He misses out on an awful lot of sensory stimuli. So what he really needs is um, lots of alerting and organisation activities in his um, in order to regulate himself. Um, and an awful lot of that because he has a big cup. All right. Remember the big cup he took up at the beginning. All right. Um, a rabbit. A rabbit's got a little cup. So really doesn't need a huge amount of too much being poured in there because love their heart. Rabbit's already overflown as it is, you know, but needs a lot, a lot more help with um, being able to be organized and calmer within their body. So there's lots of heavy work involved with this young person as well, which we'll go into at some um, in a minute um, they need a bit of everything they need alerting um, and two lots of organizing organizing they need dub they need doubling up on the organizing um, yeah okay right so this is Tigger this one always makes me giggle because the majority of my young people in my class were Tiggers there's no doubt about it so this one always makes me smile a bit so Tigger has got a big huge cup needs loads and loads being put into him no alerting activities in any way for Mr. Tigger, please. Lots of organisation and lots of calming activities. Um, yeah, and I've added in there the bit about weighted blankets, belts and vests and stuff, just so we can just so we can remember about that. OK, so here are some examples of alerting activities. Now, I'm not saying these are all the activities you could ever do. But I'm hoping that it will give you some ideas that will then spark your imagination. You can then go off and add to them. The ones that I've highlighted are because they involve touch. Now, I'm very, very aware that you guys um, as tutors are out of kind of the, the learning environment of a school. Now, in school, we would be super hands on with our young people and there'd be lots of deep pressure and tapping and all of that going on. Obviously, in terms of working as a tutor, then rules are quite different. So I've just highlighted all the way through the ones in yellow that, um, that relate to touch, because I just think you need to be a little bit careful with that and be more aware. Um, but it doesn't mean you, you've still got lots of other ex, um, examples of things that you can do. I particularly like dancing to upbeat music. I think it makes me laugh. But yeah, lots of different things. We've, we try to pull together different ideas of activities that aren't massively equipment based because it's great that in, in schools we would have these great big sensory rooms that can meet young people's needs and we'd have hammocks and we'd have it all going on. But families tend to not have those kinds of resources in their, in their homes, which is why the biggest resource in all of these is the adult. And yes, you might need a few little um, kind of um, objects or whatnot, but the majority of it is you as the adult. So, right, I'm not going to read through that because we can all read, can't we? So, okay. Um, so these are um, examples of organising activities. Um, I, I do like the first one though, encouraging crawling across a variety of surfaces such as over a blanket, over pillows, through an adult's leg or, or a carpet, because that takes up so much amount of work to plan 
complete halfway through still make sure I know what I'm doing that's a huge piece of work and that really really will help with the organization um, in the young person um, lots of it is quite straightforward like color matching puzzles it's some of these activities will think be things that you will naturally do but I just want you to now be a little bit more aware of why you're doing them and actually some things um you can you can just add like I say just add to your like little bag of tricks of what you can be doing so complete put wall push-ups and sit-ups on the floor uh, some of our young people really do enjoy that and they get an awful lot of feedback from that yeah this one's an indoor obstacle course I always think that sounds absolutely fabulous but yeah so and then here are some examples of calming activities um in terms of like heavy work we would often use backpacks for our young people and have well have them filled up with all sorts because if you're going to work if you're going to do something in the garden with them for example then wearing a backpack is just going to put so much good deep pressure through their shoulders but actually then that's not going to involve you having to actually touch them um and for some young people being touched is really tricky anyway isn't it so yeah backpacks are always a winner um but I did like the one about being wrapped up like a tortilla in a blanket or a duvet. See, we would do that at school, but obviously tutoring is slightly different. So